Hello, my name is Ralph Walkling. I'm the Stratakis Chair in Corporate Governance and Executive Director of the Center for Corporate Governance at Drexel University. I'm honored to be interviewing Professor Michael Jensen today on behalf of the editors of Journal of Applied Finance and FMA Online. Before starting, I'd like to thank Mike Jensen for his time, Betty Simpkins and the editors of Journal of Applied Finance for this idea and opportunity, and Jack Rader and the folks at University of South Florida and the Oklahoma State University for their work on this project. I'd also like to thank my friends from our profession who have critiqued and suggested some of the questions for this interview. These include Steve Buser, John Karpoff, David Peterson, Jack Rader, Laura Starks, Eric Ruck, and David Yermak. Michael C. Jensen is the Jesse Isidore Strauss Professor of Business Administration Emeritus of the Harvard Business School. Mike is one of the most celebrated and accomplished leaders of our profession, a scholar, a mentor, a thought leader, and an entrepreneur. He is the author of more than 100 scientific papers in addition to numerous articles, comments, and editorials in the popular media on a wide range of economic, finance, and business-related topics. He is the author of several path-breaking books. Research uh, by, of Mike has been downloaded more than 400,000 times, making him the most downloaded author on the SSRN. And that's just since 1994, almost 20 years after publishing his pathbreaking work with William Meckling in 1976. Mike's 1976 article, Theory of the Firm, Managerial Behavior, Agency Costs and Ownership, co-authored with Bill Meckling, is the most cited paper on SSRN with over 2,200 citations from papers on SSRN. Google Scholar reports that this paper has over 18,000 citations in its database. The paper was also awarded the JFE, Journal of Financial Economics, All-Star Paper Award as one of the most cited papers in the period from its publication through 2001. Mike has won numerous awards. I'll mention just a few of them. He was, was awarded the Financial Intermediation Research Society Lifetime Achievement Award in 2009. He has two papers that are awarded the JFE All-Star Paper Award as one of JFE's most cited papers in the period from their publication through 2001. These include some anomalous evidence regarding market efficiency, which was published in June of 1978, and the market for corporate control, the scientific evidence, co-authored with Richard Ruback in March of 1983. Mike was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences He's a member of the Advisory Board Mind Brain Behavior Initiative at Harvard from 1993 to 2000. In addition to his outstanding scholarship, there are a few other contributions. For example, Mike and his co-authors invented the market model and hence the event study. He created Jensen's Alpha, a universally used measure of investment performance. Mike co-founded the Journal of Financial Economics one of the top three scientific journals in financial economics. Since 2003, Mike has been a member of the Barbados Group, a worldwide group of a dozen scholars from diverse areas seeking to develop the ontological foundations of performance. He's the recipient of numerous accolades and awards from universities and organizations around the world. One of the year's 25 most fascinating business people by fortune past president of the American Finance Association and Western Economic Association International, past scholar of the year by the Eastern Finance Association, and the recipient of Drexel's award for, first award for outstanding research in corporate governance. It's no exaggeration to say that Mike is the original and driving force behind the wealth of research in corporate governance over the past 30 years. He's the academic father of modern corporate governance. Mike, you've made so many contributions in so many areas. I know this special issue that we're taping is related to corporate governance, but the profession would really benefit from at least touching on some of the other areas. Let me start with asset pricing and then return to entrepreneurship and some of the other areas. After leaving Chicago with your PhD, 
You immersed yourself in the field of asset pricing. Ultimately, your work produced what's known as Jensen's Alpha. Initially, you used this to measure mutual fund performance, but now it's ubiquitous in many academic and practitioner arenas. Can you tell us how you came to this breakthrough, and have you been surprised by its near universal appeal? Well, I was very fortunate to be completing my PhD dissertation at the University of Chicago at about the same time that the Center for Research and Security Prices was completing its work on putting together its initial database. So there was a lot of work and a lot of interest amongst the students and faculty at that point in understanding better what determined returns. Um, it was started out with mostly an interest in random walks later to become the efficient market hypothesis. And um, I made use of that technology and some of that database in attacking the question of how we evaluated mutual fund performance. And, and Jensen's Alpha came out of that effort. Uh, that Mutual fund performance was, on my, was my thesis, and the second paper that came out in the Journal of Finance was um, using alpha as a measure of uh, fund performance. That, that must have been an exciting time. It was. Um, can you tell us what led to the first event study, Fama, Fisher, Jensen, and Roll? Well, yeah, so one of the things that was very exciting about those times was the graduate students that I got to associate with. Gene Fama was a graduate student when I was there, and he joined the faculty uh, relatively short, shortly on, and I shared an office with Myron Scholes and Dick Roll and a few other people who have uh, done extremely well in the profession. So it was a very interesting and creative time. The, um, so the, the interest in mutual fund returns was a natural, and, and then there was this hubbub of activity interested in, in random walks and efficient market uh, theory, and along with that, uh, a few years earlier had come Markowitz's portfolio uh, analysis paper, and, um, and uh, Bill Sharp's work and John Lintner's work on capital asset pricing models. And so it was natural to begin to apply that, that material to the database that was now available. In fact, Dick Roll, when we were working on the uh, event study paper, was, I believe, the first non-CRISP person to ever use the CRSP database. And uh, was a testimony to uh, Dick's uh, uh, initiative and perse perseverance. I'll bet your computational abilities at that time were a little different than they are today. <laughs> yeah, we were, using a, we were using punch cards to access the mainframe at the center over there, and it was, we were always deathly afraid that somebody was going to spill the, the card deck, and then we would be done. But uh, yeah, that was a 7094 with, I think, 256K bytes of memory. It was ridiculously small. But we thought it was really big time stuff. Now we use more power than that to run our calendars. That's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, Mike, having had so much success in asset pricing, what led you into agency theory and corporate governance? That's a bit of a story. Um, within about two years after I got to the, what is now the Simon School of Business at the University of Rochester, Bill Meckling was the dean. Uh, he and I decided to begin teaching a course um, on, um, on the application of economics to the organizational problems of a large multi-divisional firms. We did that because we observed that the students didn't think economics was useful. Um, and um, so obviously we weren't doing something right in the teaching of economics. And we taught it in the, in the, as the first course in the executive development program at Rochester. And in the early stages, Kenny French was our um, uh, teaching assistant. In the early stages, we concentrated on transfer pricing and those kinds of matters. What happened to us, we ended up getting captured by the organizational problems and 
kind of lost interest in teaching economics and the basics of price theory. And so Ken had to make up for our defection by teaching price theory in the evenings and on weekends to the students, for which we were very grateful. The actual, so that had created an interest in, in the firm for us uh, that continues in my own work to this day. Um, the actual precipitation of that paper came about when Carl Bruner, who was on our faculty, the macroeconomist, uh, was a uh, Swiss uh, citizen, invited us to come to the Interlochen conference that he had started to bring American economists and uh, European economists uh, who tended to be um, much more liberal, even Marxist, than, uh, than, than the U.S. scene. And Bill and I accepted the task to give this paper, which was meant to be a bit of a trigger to the attendees at that conference, which was well, I don't remember what the exact title of it, but it was something about, similar to what Milton Friedman's piece shortly before then in the, in the New York Times Magazine had touted. It was something like the, the business of business is to make profits or something like that. So Bill and I decided to, we were working on putting this paper together and the more we looked at it, the more we became convinced that um, you couldn't say that as a positive description about what went on in business firms. And um, so that was the beginning of breaking open the black box of the firm thought of as an actor in the system. Obviously firms don't act, only individuals act, and firm be firms have behavior, and the behavior is the uh, behavior of the system as a whole. By the time we went to deliver that paper, we decided we had no confidence that you could say that what business firms actually did was to maximize profits in the simple-minded uh, notion of that, of that sense. And, um, and so that turned out to be very controversial. And what there'd been, even at that day, in those days, interest in what was called transactions cost economics. Uh, the trouble with that, it didn't provide much actionable access to, any, to anything. Uh, it was simply a name that described our ignorance uh, of a whole lot of things. And uh, so uh, over the years, Bill and I working on that paper, we were able to open up that black box and look at the conflicts of interest. Not only, we tended to focus in that paper on the conflicts of interest between stockholders and bondholders and managers and a little bit on the conflicts of interest between bondholders and stockholders. It's a lot of resistance in publishing it. Oh boy, did we ever. And by the way, this is not unusual. Talk to most any, anybody, they will tell you that their most important work was rejected and ours was too. We originally submitted it to the Bell Journal of Economics. Oliver Williamson was the um, editor at that time. And uh, uh, the referees uh, turned it down flat. It, it was more than just turned it down. They were absolutely incensed that anybody would even deign to submit a paper like this to the Bell Journal. And, um, and uh, so, in, that was a bit discouraging and when we got the rejection. And uh, uh, it was interesting, at that time, Bill, uh, Gene Fama, who was along with Bob Merton, uh, were co-editors, co-founding editors with me of the Journal of Financial Economics. Um, and I think was started in 1973. Uh, Gene was in Belgium uh, and somehow got a hold of a copy of the paper and sent me an unsolicited acceptance for the Journal of Financial Economics. <laughs> and I appreciated his good taste, um, <laughs> and so did Bill. Um, I would have never done that myself, but since Gene did, then I could accept it. And so I told Bill, you know, this is gonna be a very important paper in the profession, and I'm gonna make it the lead article. <laughs> I, I was the managing editor at the time, so I got to do that, and, and it turned out that it was a big hit. It, it's worked out, pleasure. I think. Yeah. 
Uh, well, well, actually, to back up to your uh, market model piece, uh, did, was that initially accepted or was that rejected? Uh, the market model, you're talking about the stock split paper yeah, that Pharma, paper. Fisher, Jensen, and Roll were involved in when we were graduate students. No, that was rejected, too, by uh, every, every journal we sent it to, and that's how it ended up being published in uh, as this unknown place uh, called the International Economic Review. And in fact, uh, you know, there was this, we were very fortunate to be involved in this revolution that was taking place in finance from the old line finance to modern finance. And what was happening is that in our way of seeing it, the old guys wouldn't publish anything we wrote. Um, so we decided to fix that by starting our own journal. And that's how the JFE got started. Uh, co-edited with uh, Gene Fama and Bob Merton, uh, who were both obviously very young in those days, too. And uh, so it, it didn't take very long for, we had a, basically a monopoly on all good stuff. But by the way, you, you might, I'd like to mention that um, if you talk to the guys at Chicago or if you ask Myron Scholes um, about it, you can't ask Fisher Black, the Journal of Political Economy turned down the option pricing paper flat. And uh, I gather there was a, a team, probably Gene and Merton, who went over to the economics department at Chicago and talked to the editors and explained to them how important that paper was. And eventually it did get published. So, um, you know, if you ever do anything new, I guarantee you it will be resisted and rejected. In fact, um, when Bill and I gave the first version of that paper at, to our colleagues, he was the dean at the, at the School of Business at, at the Simon School. This is the agency. This is the agency paper, yeah. Um, our colleagues and friends, who consisted of the audience, uh, ran us out of the room on a rail. <laughs> They were furious at us. Um, and uh, I remember to this day uh, walking out of that room in the, in the face of this antagonism and almost hatred. Um, Bill and I walked up to his office. It was one floor up, and he had this big desk, and he smoked these big black cigars. And we never said a word to each other. And, got up there and I sat on one side of the desk and he sat on the other and he pulled out a cigar and put his feet up on the desk and lit, lit his cigar and he said, well, Mike, we sure didn't sell that one. <laughs> and uh, and a, a slightly different version, but essentially the same thing happened several years later when I was invited to go to the finance workshop at the University of Chicago. Bishop Black was there at that time and Burton Miller and Gene Fama, who were my, uh, part of my thesis committee. Uh, Mert was my chairman, uh, and various others. Uh, and it was an equally riotous uh, reception, partly caused by me. Um, I think it was Gene introduced me and uh, gave the title of the paper, and I started the seminar by saying, the paper has a subtitle, um, you'll know I'm a troublemaker. Um, and the subtitle is uh, Why Chapter 4 of the White Bible is All Wrong. <laughs> now, the White Bible was a reference to the original version of the theory of finance by Merton and Fama. <clears throat> and it was in white covers. And Chapter 4 had to do with the fact that capital structure didn't count. <clears throat> so. That, that seminar, there wasn't a lot of knowledge transfer either. Uh, and, and it was something like 20 or 25 years later, when I think it was at Merton's 60th or 70th birthday party when he and I were on a panel where Merton finally sort of said there was something in that paper. Merton Miller. Yeah, Merton Miller. Yeah, Merton Miller. Um, <laughs> that's a great story. Let's turn to another seminal piece, Mike, your free cash flow piece in, uh, in 1986. Um, that paper has been highly cited, highly uh, influential, but all the evidence seems to state that um, firms have hoarded cash. They've done the opposite of what you might have suggested. And in light of the crisis, 
Some of them have come out perhaps uh, looking uh, better because of that. Do you have any thoughts of that? Have you reconsidered the theory? Well, it, I haven't looked at that paper for a long time, uh, but a part of the theory of that paper was the precautionary motive for holding cash balances. The paper was about more than holding cash balances. The paper was about what do you do when a firm is generating more cash inflow, net cash inflow, than it can possibly profitably invest? And that's the argument for, for paying them out as dividends. And uh, that doesn't solve the problem because if you simply pay out annually this excess cash, excess in addition to um, what it takes to run the firm and the precautionary cash balances to take you over any emergencies or unsuspected things. There are very good reasons for holding that, and that was actually part of the theory. But if you're only paying out the, the annual extra cash, you still have this enormous borrowing power based on the ability to capitalize um, uh, the future excess cash flows. And what that does then is provide temptations for managers to gold plate the factories to invade in. It was about that time that the market for corporate control was becoming pretty active to engage in value-destroying acquisitions, which got rid of a lot of cash and levered firms up. So no, I wouldn't change the basic theory. I would say those who correctly saw that there was uh, tough times coming uh, prior to this uh, turned down recessionary period, uh, were well advised to have large cash balances and, and a lower debt equity ratio. You can't get away from that. So you've got, there are no free lunches. You're going to have situations where uh, if, you, if you keep all of that cash inside the firm and, and don't lever up so that you've got these, this enormous amount of borrowing power, and you combine that with no profitable investment opportunities, there's going to be massive waste. So as you move away from that, you'll create value. Now, if you go too far, you're going to destroy it. We'll, uh, we'll come back to the financial crisis, at, uh, the, the most recent financial crisis. But it strikes me that uh, unlimited access to cash is something that uh, governments have since they're printing it. Right. And it's a huge problem. And we're watching it. Uh, we're watching it take place um, as we speak. And there's a, we all like power, and this is an opportunity for those who have power in the government to transfer decision rights from the private sector and resources from the private sector to the public sector. Uh, and there is an appropriate role for government, but um, my own belief is that we're going to look back on this episode and see that the government did some very good things in preventing the uh, collapse of financial markets and the impact that that would have on the economy. But we're going to be saddled with um, uh, the enormous inefficiency that comes when you put decision rights and resources in the hands of the government. My own, the biggest risk right now is that we'll see double and perhaps even triple digit inflation as a result of the massive increases in the money supply that's taken place and the very delicate task uh, that's going to be involved in the federal authorities to not only reduce the rate of growth of the money supply but to reduce the absolute uh, size of the money supply and they have to do it at a time before we're fully out of the recession. And if they don't, we could easily find ourselves in hyperinflation um, and all of the damage that comes from that. Do I think that's a high probability event? I don't know, probably on the order of 25 to 40 percent. Uh, but I wouldn't be shocked to see it happen. Mike, you mentioned power. Um, let's turn to the market for corporate control. In your 1983 presidential address, you challenged the conventional notion that mergers and acquisitions were harmful and contended that they provided an efficient solution to the problem of, of excess capacity. Can you talk about the misconceptions that existed at that time, at the end of the 1980s, and do you think that misconception still exists today? Well, um, the 
frame within which people saw that, especially boards of directors and CEOs and other top level managers in firms that had gone through this period, you know, we went through in the 60s, the period of growth through conglomerate, conglomeration. And the evidence indicated that something on the, on the, on the order of 50% of, of uh, the value, or the potential value of, of uh, all corporations had been destroyed. Um, there are a number of pieces of evidence which are consistent with that. And, and what then began to happen is the proxy mechanism was very clumsy. You had managers, as shows up in Kevin Murphy's and my work on management compensation, you had paid managers who were being paid for making their firms larger, as measured by revenues in particular, and not more valuable. Uh, and there was massive amount of value destruction uh, going on out there. And uh, little by little, people began to figure out, I've forgotten now the first case, it was in the 1970s, somebody made a small offer for one of the firms, my, my memory is uh, failing me, Anyway, and they found, they were looking to buy 10% of the stock, and they found something like 60 or 70% of the stock was tendered to them. I wish I could remember the name of that firm. And, uh, and so... Was it Conoco? It may well have been. I think it was an oil company. Yeah. Um, it's been a long time since I've... Dome Petroleum, I think, with Conoco. Um, that I've uh, reread any of that stuff. And so... Little by little, what happened was the market for corporate control, that term uh, had been invented by Henry Manny maybe a decade earlier, uh, really started to become into being. Richard Ruback was doing his uh, work on tender offers at that time um, at the University of Rochester. He was a student of mine in the doctoral program and, uh, and a few others. and. Um, Suddenly, we had this active market for corporate control that was generating lots of angst on the part of managers whose jobs were now being threatened and the boards of directors whose positions were being threatened. And the companies and all of the people that had interests in those companies, uh, labor and, and communities, and um, it wasn't greeted with great uh, smiles as some outsiders came in, offered more, uh, substantial premiums on the order of 30 to 50 percent of the entire value of the equity to uh, transfer ownership. And um, what we saw, I mean, you can have bad results of that. The conglomeration era was one where people were, uh, firms were diversifying because they had excess cash flow, excess borrowing power, and destroying value, but that mostly was done on friendly terms. Now we had the so called graders enter the scene, they were outsiders, um, and it was considered unethical, inappropriate. Um, and the result, without a doubt, was massive uh, creation of value and elimination of the, through the elimination of the value destruction that had gone on in the last decade or two in the conglomeration era and the, and the deconglomeration of, an old, of a very large number of those firms. Um, and then that then metamorphosed into the leverage buyout phenomenon, now called pri private equity. Um, and, you know, there's um, nothing happens uh, that generates positive effects without having some negative effects being generated as well. Um, so was it absolutely 100% uh, success and always a good thing? No. But on the whole, was it a good thing for the economy? Uh, the American economy was losing badly to the Japanese, and as a result of that restructuring and those activities, uh, the whole thing turned around in less than a decade. Have you seen much, uh, or, or what evolution have you seen in the past 10 to 20 years since that time in the market for corporate control, and is it still effective today? Well, I don't know. I'm, you know, you can't, you can't remain an expert in everything you did. And so I don't spend as much time looking at that material as I did then, did then but, uh, in the evidence. But the, 
it's clear that one of the things that happened in that development, in the, as I mentioned a moment ago, the leverage buyout phenomenon now called private equity arose as kind of a natural result of that. It was a new way to actually create conglomerates uh, without uh, the damage from the conglomeration. And it was basically a new competitor for the governance system of, of large publicly held firms. And, uh, and by these outsiders buying firms, mostly on a voluntary basis, but then it became hostile on occasion, as in RJR and Nabisco. Um, and putting them in a totally different governance system that I outlined back in 1988 or 89, in that Harvard Business Review piece that I, I won't repeat all of that now, it was clearly a better, um, better designed governance system and produced amazing results along with a whole lot of controversy about whether it was a good thing. In the early days, there were congressional hearings to get all that stopped. Uh, I, I was uh, invited to come down and give testimony and that's about what the facts were, and that was what resulted in that article. Eclipse of the Corporation. Yeah, um, which basically laid out the intellectual foundations for what was going on. The interesting part about that was I had occasion to look back at the Jensen Meckling agency paper, and we had, there was in a page or two, we had invented leverage buyouts in that paper. Um, uh, but uh, we didn't call them that, uh, and we just talked about them instead of doing them, <laughs> much to my uh, regret. And, uh, you know, a number of years later, they actually came about, um, which, which pleased me. If you were revising Eclipse of the Corporation today, any changes you'd make to it? <sighs> or writing it for today, I should say. Well, if commenting on, on, on it, I, I was invited a few years ago, maybe two, three years ago now, to revisit that material when uh, Jay Light invited me to give a talk to a group of 100 or 150 private equity guys in New York City as part of the Harvard Business School's birthday celebration that went on for over a year. And I said at that time, which was at the height of the success of private equity and, and uh, that there was a, uh, changes going on as a result of um, some very bad mistakes that major players were making in the market. In the early days and for much of the period where leveraged buyouts and private equity were remarkably successful, the payoffs to the uh, to the private equity guys came in proportion to the increase, pretty much in proportion to the increase in value of the firms that they bought, put them through a chop shop and maybe brought them back to the public market or sold them off somewhere else. And there are lots of studies that showed the amazing increases in efficiency and productivity of that. Then what happened in recent times is, the, is suddenly uh, uh, Players entered the market, people like Steve Schwartzman at Blackstone and others, who became very successful but also very greedy. And they basically decided that they should have more of the proceeds. And instead of simply increasing uh, the, uh, their claim on the back end gains from uh, the roughly 20% that had existed, and what they began to do was corrupt the model and corrupt the governance system by levying transactions fees, taking special dividends. Uh, and prior to that, pretty much all payouts went out in proportion to all of the equity holders. And now suddenly the, the private equity guys are dipping their hands into the till and charging right and left for so-called services, but it was simply a way to corrupt the model and put more money in the short term into their pockets. 
I said at the time, in the front of that room, that this was going to create a crisis and scandals. Uh, it was unavoidable. And at that time, I think Fortress had just gone public, um, and other firms, Blackstone and others, were considering doing it. What I said at the time is that uh, the notion of a publicly held private equity firm um, is, uh, what's the term? It just slips my mind. It's a non sequitur, not only in the English language, but it's a non sequitur in economics and it will fail. And anybody that bought into them was a fool. Um, I think Blackstone was embarrassing how um, rapidly they went about trying to get their new issue in, done before the US Congress levied special taxes. Um, I think they went public at $35 a share and they're substantially, for a while, they were substantially under 10 to five bucks a share. I don't know what they are now. But that's all consistent with what happens when you corrupt the model. Um, there's a lot more we could say about that, but people who wanted to claim the value that they'd created were basically trying to claim value by going public that was not theirs and wasn't able to be claimed without destroying the basic model and the governance system. So we're going to see all of that sorted out over the next decade or so. And uh, my prediction is that the uh, publicly held private equity firm will turn out to have been a, um, a mistake. Um, looking at the Blackstone uh, new issue uh, agreements, I'm just astounded because they actually asked the holders of the new equity to sign agreements. Uh, it was part of the, a part of the deal which, uh, which um, um, relieved Blackstone and its partners, who maintain control of it, of any fiduciary responsibility whatsoever uh, to the new common stock claimants. Now, anybody that bought into an arrangement like that was a fool, and they're not going to get exactly what they deserve. <laughs> Very little. Mike, it strikes me that there's a parallel between your talk of private equity and what happened to investment bankers uh, near the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. And when too much money chasing too few deals and trying to get uh, uh, creative about uh, the whole process. Right. And um, too creative. And that you know, brings us to the, to the financial crisis that we've been dealing with, which. Do you, um, think, do you think that the government intervention would, have been, would be necessary today if we had a fully functioning market for corporate control? I don't know. I can't answer that question. Uh, I haven't thought about it enough. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering how the auto industry continues to uh, continue to underperform for decade after decade. And I can recall some discussions and panels you were on, where you were highly critical of what was going on in Detroit decades before uh, uh, the the current crisis. All right. I went to the Harvard Business School in 1984. I think uh, the auto industry signed that disastrous labor contract providing for full employment, permanent lifetime full employment for auto workers in 1985. I know for several years in the course I created and the group we created at Harvard, uh, the CCMO, coordination, control, and the management of organizations. I used to devote, we used to devote an entire day talking about the coming bankruptcy of the uh, American automobile industry, in particular General Motors we focused on. Because there was simply no way that a firm could sign a contract like that that guaranteed its labor force. I think it was something like 96 or 98 percent of their annual income for life, uh, it locked them in, it made labor a fixed cost, and it locked them into a set of contracts that, unless they got out of them, uh, which they couldn't, was going to destroy the American automobile industry. 
I thought it was going to happen in five to ten years. It was more like 20 or 30 years. But it did happen, and the seeds of it, there were other things, but the seeds of it were in that contract. Weak management caved into thinking they had the power to manage it. Uh, unreasonable demands on the part of labor that had a lot of power. It wasn't in labor's interest to do that. Uh, if you look at the studies of what happened to the people who got laid off and had to sit in rooms, uh, they, broken marriages, drug addiction, because they couldn't take a job anywhere else without losing this free ride, it, it had a devastating effect both on the industry and on the people who were nominally benefited by it. It's a huge mistake, and the full story of that has never really been told in the, in the public, but it was predictable. I thought it would happen sooner, and uh, it did happen. And now they're in the process of rewriting those contracts, and it, and it may, may leave something to be saved. <laughs>